just someone comes and meets you, they have an early colon cancer or whatever it might be that has to be removed from the colon, you're trying to get them back up, walking, eating, how soon? Ideally the same day for getting up and walking. You the know, we'll same give, day as surgery, you are getting people out of bed. If, yes, the, as soon as the anesthesia wears off, we want them out of bed, sitting in a chair, and you know, once they're not feeling lightheaded or dizzy from the anesthesia, getting up and, and walking with assistance. Fantastic. And we're usually starting clear liquids the same day, and if they're tolerating clear liquids, the following day starting a regular diet. So this is different from when we trained as medical students and even as residents um, years ago, that we used to slowly, the next day maybe, get someone to swing their legs out of the bed, right. wait for them to pass flatus or gas, wait for them to have a bowel movement before we would even think about giving them a glass of water even sometimes. It, we really found that by minimizing the amount of tubes we leave in people, we would put nasogastric tubes in which were very uncomfortable for patients taking the Foley catheter out of their bladder as soon as possible after surgery, the less tubes and things that people have going into their bodies, the better they do in so general. These are common sense things that we used to talk about but have been studied now and have been proven to mm -hmm. enhance the recovery. So folks now come out of the operating room, they're moving, they're eating quicker, and they're getting out of the hospital. How long does the average patient after a colon resection for cancer stay in, in the hospital? For the average patient with you know, very few medical problems, somewhere between two to five days is, is the average now for the, these enhanced recovery protocols. And generally, you know, people are leaving the hospital when they're feeling like they're ready. It's not like we're rushing them out. But usually by the second, third, fourth day, people are feeling well enough that they just don't want to be in the right. hospital anymore and they want to leave. Most patients don't want to stay in the hospital. It's right. not a hotel, it's not a resort. <laughs> Hospitals are tough places, hard to sleep. We catch infections in the hospital. And so I agree in my practice as well. Uh, obviously I don't do colon surgeries, but after doing certain of, uh, types of our procedures or for other reasons, I really encourage patients, ambulate, get out of bed quickly, move your extremities. A yeah. body in motion stays in motion mm -hmm. and it is good for their health. And we're seeing it now you're able to get patients out of the hospital so, so quickly after a colon resection. So this offers hope to our viewers and to our patients that God forbid they have a friend or a family member or themselves where they've been diagnosed with something like this, they're gonna be able to go to a surgeon like you, have a minimally invasive surgery, minimal scar, minimal recovery time, and cure colon cancer. Yeah, it's really amazing that we're able to do this. When you think back to what people used to have to go through, you know, we've really made a lot of advances with modern medicine, and I think there's even more to come. But I think it's really important that the viewers understand most people who have colon cancer, this is a preventable disease, and by getting screened, they can avoid the surgery and not have to go through all of this. That's the goal. The goal here in Brooklyn and nationwide is we want all patients who are candidates for screening, who can undergo the screening, to come and see us. There mm -hmm. are options. Um, to get screened and preventing this disease is our goal. We don't want them to end up in your hands, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You're a crafty and talented <laughs> surgeon, but I would prefer that we eliminate colon cancer. And, and we started out the conversation a little while ago about surgery, uh, talking about rectal bleeding. And we know, thank goodness, not all rectal bleeding is cancer, and not all rectal bleeding is as simple as a hemorrhoid from pushing or straining. And in my practice and, and in the practice of gastroenterology, we are taught to investigate bleeding no matter the age, mm -hmm. no matter the circumstance. And so sometimes I do colonoscopies and I find that there is nothing wrong inside the colon. The bleeding looks like it came from a big external hemorrhoid possibly or a large internal hemorrhoid. Maybe the patient was very constipated, maybe they were pushing very hard or they have a job where they're sitting all day long. And we have ways as gastroenterologists to help uh, particularly the internal hemorrhoids by putting bands, we can put rubber bands on the hemorrhoid. We can burn the hemorrhoid using uh, IRC, which is infrared heat. Some patients refer to this as a laser. Right. It's not in fact a laser, but it is a heat process. But sometimes I have to send them over to you for treatment of hemorrhoids. So talk to me, uh, say I'm the patient who comes in with rectal bleeding and I've got an external hemorrhoid that really has caused me pain and bleeding and I wanna have it removed or fixed. How do you approach the situation? So I make sure that the patient understands the disease process, understands what 
their treatment options are. And there's some people that we can get better just with diet and lifestyle changes, and they don't even have to have a surgical procedure done. For people who have tried those things and they haven't worked, you know, there are surgery procedures such as hemorrhoidectomy that we can do to get rid of the bleeding. Um, you mentioned other options like rubber band ligation or infrared coagulation, which are almost painless procedures. And you know, those are things we offer to patients to try to get the bleeding to stop. Um, but I think it is really important, as you mentioned, that people who have bleeding, even if they attribute it to things like hemorrhoids, get it checked out, get a health professional to look and make sure that that's actually what's going on. Right. And so other sources of bleeding we should talk about, anal fissures. Uh, sometimes they can bleed. And for the viewers at home, uh, explain to us what an anal fissure is in some simple lay terms sure. <laughs> that our folks at home can understand. So an anal fissure happens, usually people have a traumatic bowel movement where they were constipated and the opening tears a little bit. The anal muscle then becomes too tight as a reaction to that. And so every time they go to the bathroom, they have some pain and some bleeding. And it's really because the opening is too tight. Right. And so with treatments, usually medications is how we start. With medications or with surgical procedures, we can get those people better and get their pain and bleeding to stop. Right, so one of the classic histories I take in the office is a patient who comes in and says, listen, I was constipated a week or two ago. Mm -hmm. I really was straining. The stool was very large or hard, and I had terrible pain after I saw a touch of blood. Mm -hmm. And now the patient says to me, every time I go, it is painful. It burns and then it throbs after. And that's almost 100% diagnostic for an anal fissure right. in my office. Uh, I, I would say 99% of the time when, the, when that is the story, on exam I am finding an anal fissure. And so we use what you said, topical therapies. Mm -hmm. I have read and I have seen you do certain procedures on my patients and other docs that we can use Botox, in fact. Correct, that's one of the newer treatments for anal fissures. And basically the problem is the muscle is too tight. So by using Botox, it's the same Botox you use on your face, you can- Different needle. Exactly. <laughs> you can paralyze the anal muscle and make that opening a little larger using Botox. And about 80% of patients will get their fissure to heal using, using Botox. And so it's a very good new technique to use for these anal fissures. And the last resort, obviously, is we have some surgical procedures for patients with refractory or fissures that will not help heal on their own. Right, and that procedure is called a sphincterotomy, where we actually cut a little bit of the muscle that's making the opening too tight. And by cutting it, the opening becomes a little bigger. It lets bowel movements come out easier and allows the fissure to heal. Right, and, and this is all in addition to talking about diet, I educate my patients on fiber, sitting mm -hmm. in a warm bath here and there. What other natural ways or lifestyle ways can you suggest you know, to help our patients with this? So for people who have fissures, the best way to get these to heal naturally is with a, a good healthy diet, which means lots of fiber, lots of fruits and vegetables, mm -hmm. taking a fiber supplement if, if they're not getting enough through um, fruits and vegetables. And that's the main natural way to get these to heal. Right, I suggest to my patients a bowl of fiber cereal in the morning and then try to incorporate a large salad later in the day mm -hmm. because many of the diseases that you and I deal with in the area of the rectum or the anus can be helped with an improved diet or improving their bowel function. I want to move on to another topic related to rectal bleeding and that is the inflammatory bowel diseases. So another reason why we investigate folks who have recurrent episodes of bleeding particularly if their blood counts are abnormal, if they're having changes in their bowel habits. For example, if someone comes to us uh, with uh, diarrhea and they have bleeding and some abdominal pain or weight loss, you know, we certainly we do colonoscopies or other types of procedures to diagnose uh, not just cancer, not just hemorrhoids or fissures, but to look for Crohn's and colitis. Unfortunately, some of these diseases are gonna require that I involve you in their care mm -hmm. or a rectal surgeon or colon surgeon in their care. For folks who unfortunately end up in your hands and need to have surgery, what are some of the things that you're doing? Is, are there still minimally invasive techniques if someone needs to have their colon uh, removed or have a piece of bowel removed due to Crohn's? How do you approach this as well? So we tailor the treatment to the patient because every patient is different. But as often as possible, if people are a candidate for minimally invasive techniques, we're going to do those. And so for a lot of people who have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, there are minimally invasive 
surgical techniques that we can do to treat their small bowel or colonic disease. I think it's really important for those people that they have a regular screening exam by their gastroenterologist mm -hmm. because of the risk, the increased risk of colon cancer in those diseases. Um, so it's, it's very important that they right. also you, get checked. You bring up an important topic there. We, we started off the segment today talking about colon cancer risk. And so one of the increased risk factors for colon cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, like for example, folks with ulcerative colitis, we will do colonoscopies on them quite frequently. Unfortunately, there are some times where we may find polyps or what we call dysplasia, abnormal mm -hmm. tissue changes inside the colon, and they require what we call a colectomy. And that's where a colon and rectal surgeon, such as you, Dr. Burkholder, will have to remove the colon. But I want you to touch a little bit on this because we had a patient on our previous segment who was worried about colostomy. Right. And tell us, the, not every patient ends up requiring a colostomy or sometimes they have just a temporary. Educate our viewers today on why folks who need to have their colon removed may not always need to have what we call a bag or a colostomy. Right, so that's one of the fears that many patients have when I first meet them. And it's one of the questions that they'll often ask at our first meeting is, am I going to need to have a bag? And for most people, the answer is that they're probably not going to need one. Um, most colon surgeries can be done without requiring patients to have a bag. I will say that for patients who do have one, it often winds up not being as bad as they feared it would be to have it, but we, in most cases, can avoid giving patients a bag, and I'm, I'm always happy when I finish a surgery and, and one isn't required. And even if people do require a bag, a lot of times it's temporary and can be eventually removed and they can go back to having bowel movements the normal way again. Right, it, it is rare today. There are certainly instances where it can occur where someone needs a bag or a colostomy, but for most patients, they end up waking up without one or it's temporary and Correct. can be usually three or six months down the line reversed, is that true? Correct. It often depends on whether or not there's other treatments needed, such as chemotherapy, but usually within three months they can be reversed. So we, we covered colon surgery and rectal surgery for both cancers, possibly for other diseases like Crohn's, colitis. And from what you're telling me, it sounds like these can be done minimally invasive. Patients are getting up, walking quicker, often avoiding colostomy or avoiding the bag, even if they need one. Oftentimes it's reversed quickly. And so it's very encouraging what we're seeing out of the colon and rectal surgery world. Obviously, as gastroenterologists, we'd love to treat all these diseases with medicines or diet or colonoscopies, but we need folks like you. Um, now, you're practicing here in Brooklyn. When someone comes to you with any of these colon and rectal diseases uh, and you operate out of some local hospitals uh, here, uh, do you see an increased risk of any one of these more than you saw elsewhere in your practice, whether when you were in Manhattan or when you were in Alaska? So I think I've definitely seen a trend towards younger patients. Um, and I've had patients, like you've mentioned, in their 20s who had colon cancer. There's also an increased risk in minorities to have colon and rectal cancer. And so I've, I've certainly seen that trend in my practice here compared to Right. my prior practice. And, and this is a very important point, and I'm, I'm happy you brought that up, and we're gonna end on this point. We are seeing these diseases in younger folks, and we are seeing that minorities have an increased risk. For example, the African-American population has a higher risk of cancer. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you brought that up as a unique issue here in Brooklyn, and I hope folks will come out and see their gastroenterologist, see their colon and rectal surgeon, and their primary care physician to help prevent diseases such as this. I want to thank you, and I'd like to thank Dr. Burkholder for uh, joining us today. Thank you for your interest in our show and your desire to become more involved and educated about your health. I invite you to visit our website, www.medcastplus.com, and check out our tools and connect with us on social media. You can also call us at 718-510-2103. I am Dr. Jack Braha. Thank you for watching. Stay well and stay healthy, Brooklyn. Goodbye. <laughs>